reading through the Bible in one year. October 2nd, 1 Kings chapters 4 through 5, Ephesians chapter 2, Ezekiel 35, and Psalm 85. Solomon, or King Solomon, reigned over all Israel, and these were his officials. Azariah, son of Zadok the priest, um, Elihoreph, or Elihoreph, um, and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, a uh, court historian. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, in charge of the army. Zadok and Abiathar, priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the deputies. Zabud, son of Nathan, a priest and advisor to the king. Ahisar, or Az, Az, Ahiz, Ahishar, Ahishar, that's a hard one to say, in charge of the palace. And Adoniram, son of Adpa, or Abda, in charge of forced labor. Solomon had twelve deputies for all Israel. They provided food for the king and his household. Each one made a provision for one month out of the year. These were their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, Ben-Decker in Makaz, uh, Sha'al-Bim, um, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan, Ben Hesed um, in Arabaf, he had Soko in the whole land of Hefer, Ben Abinadab in all uh, Nephath Dor, Tephath, daughter of Solomon, was his wife, Baana, son of Ahilud, in Tanakh and Megiddo. I want to make sure we don't lose any notes here. Um, yeah, we're gonna look. Looks like we're gonna lose those. I'm gonna go ahead and roll up so we don't miss them. Okay, and okay, uh, Baana, son of Ahilud, in Tanakh, Megiddo, and all Beth Sheon, which is beside Zarathon, below Jezreel, from Beth Sheon to um, Abel uh, Mahola, as far as the other side of Jachmia. Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead. He had the villages of Jair, son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead. And he had the region of Argob, which is in Bashan, sixty great cities with walls and bronze bars. Ahinadab, son of Edo in Mahanaim, ah ah Ahimaz in Naphtali. He also had married a daughter of Solomon, uh, Basimath, or Basimath or Basimath. Baana, son of Hushai, in Asher and Baaloth. Jehoshaphat, son of Perua, in Issachar. Shimei, son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri, in the land of Gilead. The country of King Sihon of the Amorites, and King Og of Bashan. There is one deputy in the land of Judah. Judah and Israel uh, were as numerous as the sand, of, uh, sand by the sea. They were eating, drinking, and rejoicing. Solomon ruled um, all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. They offered tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Solomon's provisions for one day were 180 bushels of fine flour and 360 bushels of meal, 10 fattened cattle, 20 range cattle, 100 sheep and goats, besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and a pen-fed poultry. For he had dominion over everything west of the Euphrates, from Tifsa to, to Gaza, and over all the kings west of the Euphrates. He had peace on all his surrounding borders. Throughout Solomon's reign, Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan to Beersheba, each person under his own vine and his own fig tree. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and, and 12,000 horsemen. Each of, the, uh, sorry, each of those deputies for a month in turn provided food for King Solomon and for everyone who came to King Solomon's table. They neglected nothing. Each man brought the barley and the straw for the chariot teams and the, uh, horse, sorry, and the other horses to the required place according to his assignment. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and understanding as vast as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than all the wisdom of the people of the east, greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. 
he was wiser than anyone. Wiser than um, um, Ethan the Ezrahite and Heman, uh, Kalkal and Darda, sons of Malal, sorry, Mahal. His reputation extended to all the surrounding nations. Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about trees from the cedar in Lebanon to the hyssop growing out of the wall. He also spoke about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Emissaries of all peoples, uh, sent by every king on earth who had heard of his wisdom, came to, to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Hiram, uh, King Hiram of Tyre, sent his emissaries to Solomon when he heard that he had been anointed king in his father's place. For Hiram had always been friends with David. Solomon sent his uh, message to Hiram. You know my father David was not able to build a temple for the name of the Lord his God. This was because of the warfare all around him until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. The Lord my God has now given me rest on every side. There is no enemy or misfortune. So I plan to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, according to what the Lord promised my father David. I will put your son on your throne in your place, and he will build, uh, build a temple for my name. Therefore, uh, command that cedars from Lebanon be cut down for me. My servants will be your servants, and I will pay your servants' wages according to whatever you say. For you know that not a man among us knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. When Hiram heard Solomon's words, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be Yahweh today. He has given David a wise son to be over this great people. Then Hiram sent a reply to Solomon, saying, I have heard your message and will do everything you want regarding the cedar or cedar and cypress timber. My servants will bring the logs down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into rafts, into rafts to go by the sea to the place you indicate. I will break them apart there, and you can take, uh, take them away. Uh, you can then meet my needs, providing my household with food. So Hiram provided Solomon uh, with all the cedar and cypress timber he wanted, and Solomon's uh, rather and Solomon hired or rather, and Solomon provided Hiram with one hundred and twenty thousand bushels of wheat as food for his household, and one hundred and twenty thousand gallons of oil from crushed olives. Solomon did this for Hiram year after year. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him. There was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. Then King Solomon drafted forced laborers from all Israel. The labor force numbered 30,000 men. He sent 10,000 to Lebanon each month in shifts. One month they were in Lebanon, and two months they were at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon had 70,000 porters and 80,000 stonecutters in the mountains, not including his 3,300 um, deputies in charge of the work. They supervised the people doing the work. The king commanded them to quarry large, costly stones to lay the foundation of the temple with dress stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders, along with the Gabalites, quarried the stone and prepared the timber and stone for the temple's construction. Let's move on now to Ephesians chapter 2. Paul continues, And you were, past tense, dead in your trespasses and sins. Again, he's talking to people about the salvation that God has provided for them. And he was speaking about this, talking in the last chapter, about all the things God does in order to bring about salvation in men. And now he turns his focus to the people themselves who are being saved. How much can a dead person do? Nothing. When you're dead and lying on the ground, can you call out for help? No, you're dead. You can lay there and rot. That's all you have. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There's no hope or help for you. In which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the, the spirit now working in the disobedient. 
We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were, by nature, children under wrath, as the others were also. He's saying the entire world is afflicted by the same thing. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love uh, that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead uh, in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I'm going to re-say that again here slowly. So God shows us in him, even though we were just in our sins, we were um, destitute and could do nothing to save ourselves. He chose us, even though we offer nothing to him, to his glory. He's the one who has done all of this work. Why? Verse 7, so that for the purpose of in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The reason why God saves you isn't because you're a great person and he wants to tell everybody that he's your friend. The reason why God saves you is for his glory, not yours. You're not the shining beacon among a, a, a dark and, de and dreary land. The only reason you're a beacon at all for anybody is because of what Christ has put in you. That's it. That's what we're being told here. Verse 8, for you are saved by grace, which you don't earn, through faith, not through works. And this is not from yourselves. It's not because you're a great person. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. There is, again, this is a very popular verse that people keep going to, where they point to the fact that, yeah, God saved me because I'm a good person. No. You have done no works to justify yourself to God. You can do nothing to justify your salvation to God. And even when you're saved, you're still going to fail until the day you die. Everything we have is from God to God for God. Even the faith that we have is a gift from him. Because if God didn't maintain our faith, we would lose it in a minute. Think back in your own life, even right now. I know because you're thinking of spiritual things and we're going over these things together, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, if, if, if I was presented with a, with a challenge of any kind, I would take care of that easily. But you know your heart. You know your struggle against your sin. You know that you daily want to please yourself. You want to serve yourself. Even Paul had the same thing and referred to this at the end of Romans chapter 7. If Paul has these struggles, do you think you're better than Paul? The point is no one is good. No one deserves anything from God. It is a gift from God so that no one has grounds to boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. This is the whole thing of predestination. God has a set path for us to go down. We don't know what it is. I don't know who I'm going to preach the gospel to. I don't know who this is going to reach and, and speak to them in their hearts and make them conflicted. And they're going to go and, and struggle over this for a while and read all the notes and try to prove me wrong only to have God reveal to them the same thing he revealed to me, that God is sovereign in all things to his glory, to his praise forevermore. It is freeing and terrifying at the same moment. And this is where we are. See how this goes? So then, 
remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the, cir the circumcised by Jews, which is done in the flesh merely by human hands. I added the word merely. At that time you were without Christ and excluded from the citizenship, or rather it excluded from citizenship of Israel. Dad right the first time, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near, not by your own works or your own innate goodness or whatever else, but by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who made uh, both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. What can the law do for you? Nothing. It's literally just said here. As we said numerous times, the law is a signpost to tell you you can't meet God's holy standard. That's it. It's a signpost driving us to Christ, to the one who did fulfill it on our behalf. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access. I lost my spot. Okay. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you who are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building, being put together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. See, this is the mystery we talked about before, the mystery that Jews and Gentiles are together in Christ Jesus. That it's something we've done and it's nothing we can do. We can't generate this on our own. It's by God's power to God's glory. The two now brought together. All right, let's go and uh, continue on in Ezekiel 35. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, face Mount Seir and prophesy against it. Say to it, This is what the Lord God says. Look, I am against you, Mount Seir. I will stretch out my hand against you and make you a desolate waste. I will turn your cities into ruins and you will become a desolation. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Because you maintained a perpetual hatred and gave the Israelites over to the power of the sword in the time of their disaster, the time of final punishment. Therefore, as I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God, I will destine you for bloodshed and it will pursue you. Since you did not hate bloodshed, it will pursue you. I will make Mount Seir a desolate waste and will cut off from it those who come and go. I will fill its mountains with the slain. Those slain by the sword will fall on your hills, in your valleys, and in all your ravines. I will make you a perpetual desolation. Your cities will not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord." Because you said, these two nations and two lands will be mine, and we will possess them, though the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God, I will treat you according to the anger and jealousy you showed in your hatred of them. I will make myself known among them when I judge you. 
Then you will know that I, the Lord, have heard all the blasphemies you uttered against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are desolate. They have been given to us uh, to devour. You boasted against me with your mouth and spoke many words against me. I heard it myself. This is what the Lord God says. While the whole world rejoices, I will make you a desolation. Just as you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it became a desolation, I will deal the same way with you. You will become a desolation. Mount Seir. And so will all Edom in its entirety. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Let's conclude in Psalm 85. Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You gave your people's guilt, or rather you forgave your people's guilt. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned from your burning anger. Return to us, God of our salvation, and abandon your displeasure with us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger for all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your faithful love, Lord, and give us your salvation. I will listen to what God will say. Surely the Lord will declare peace to his people, his faithful ones, and not let them go back to foolish ways. His salvation is very near to those who fear him, so that glory may dwell in our land. Faithful love and truth will join together. Righteousness and peace will embrace. The truth will, well, or rather, truth will spring up from the earth, and righteousness will look down from heaven. Also, the Lord will provide what is good, and our land will yield its crops. Righteousness will go before him to prepare the way for his steps. And that is all the text today and all the notes. So, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.